One queen executed. One died after childbirth. And the third married her Prince Charming. This week, we look at quite a few queens and even a sister of a queen. But we start out with the most tragic story of a well-known Scottish queen. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. The day had arrived. This day, she knew, would be her last. The sound of construction in the castle indicated that a scaffold was being built for her execution. Queen Elizabeth had signed her cousin's death warrant, and today, the former reigning Queen of Scots would die. After years locked away from the world, Mary's end was her new beginning. At the base of it, her religion was her downfall. Baptized in the Catholic Church, Mary was forced to flee Scotland as a young girl and was betrothed to the future King of France. They married in 1558, but by 1560, both Mary's husband and mother were dead. Mary returned to Scotland to reclaim her throne. Now out of her minority, and with her regent mother deceased. Her return to her native country was not as warm of a welcome as she had hoped. And from that point on in her life, Scotland was not the fairy tale she had imagined. A belief that she succeeded her Catholic cousin Mary I was at the base of her troubles. The Scottish queen presented that she believed she was the rightful ruler of England since she was Catholic, and since Elizabeth was both illegitimate and not a Catholic. But the basis of Mary's problem stems from the men in her life. She married her cousin, Henry Lord Darnley. He turned out to be a disastrous drunk and wound up dead only eight months after the birth of their son, future James VI of Scotland and I of England. Then there was Lord Bothwell. Well, I cannot tell you for certain if it was a love match, and if Mary was indeed the romantic queen I imagined her to be, but mixing up with Bothwell had negative effects for Mary. She lost her queenship. Ever the devout Catholic she was, Mary continued to fight for her throne, or maybe for any throne. Once again, she found herself in hot water, and fled to the safety of her cousin in England. Long story short, Elizabeth could never trust Mary or her Catholic sympathizers to not try to overthrow her. So Mary remained locked up in England for nearly two decades. Conspiracy was afoot, and whether true or fabricated by the English, Mary was involved in a plot. The Babington Plot. If successful, this plot would have resulted in the murder of Queen Elizabeth I and the installation of Mary as Queen of England. But as history tells us, that did not happen. Mary was found guilty. Her death warrant was signed by her cousin, the English Queen, and a date was set for the 8th of February, 1587. Interestingly enough, 20 years to the month after her husband, Lord Darnley, was murdered. When informed of her death sentence, Mary was inspired to put her feelings, her thoughts, into words. O Lord God, I have hoped in thee. Beloved Jesus, now set me free. In cruel chain and bitter pains, I have longed for thee. Now languishing in sorrow sore, upon my knees I thee implore, that thou wilt grant me liberty. Knowing that she would soon die, Mary asked for her chaplain to be delivered to her, but she was denied her request. The noise of building the scaffold had ceased before 8 a.m. on the day of her execution. 
Mary had been making her final prayers and preparations, awaiting her cue from whomever would take her to her death. When her chamber door next opened, it was to alert her that the time had come. As they made their way down the great oak staircase in Fotheringay Castle, we can imagine the thoughts that may have been going through her head. The people were images that were coming into her mind. The whisper of prayers leaving her lips. Mary mustered all that was within her when she arrived at the great hall, witnessed by all the men who had come to see her end, held her head high, and walked to her death with such bravery that anyone would admire. The scaffold was draped in black and only two feet off the ground, and a murmur had come over the crowd as she entered. When the executioner asked Mary for her forgiveness, she said, I forgive you with all my heart, for now I hope you shall make an end of all my troubles. Her ladies came forward to disrobe Mary of her outer garments, at which time it was revealed that Mary had dressed in a crimson gown. A gasp came over the crowd, the color of her gown signifying that Mary saw herself as a martyr. Mary was then blindfolded by one of her ladies. She was guided in her blindness to the wooden block in front of her, where she knelt on a cushion and then placed her neck on the block and outstretched her arms. That would be her last memory. The grandson of Mary Queen of Scots, Charles I, was married to Henrietta Maria of France, and Henrietta had a sister named Christine. Now, Christine was born on the 10th of February, 1606, to Henry IV of France and Marie de' Medici at the Louvre. She was their second daughter and third child. And as I stated, her sister was Henrietta Maria, but her brother also became later Louis XIII of France. Her sister Elizabeth was Queen Consort of Spain as well. And on her 19th birthday, Christine married future Victor Amadeus I, Duke of Savoy, they had eight children together, but of course, not all lived to adulthood. She styled her court to rival her sister's court in England and became her close confidant when her sister was exiled. Christine was Duchess of Savoy between 1630 and 1637, after which she became regent for her young son when he took over the duchy at her husband's death. When her son died in 1638, Christine had to fight with her brother-in-law, who wanted to take control from her other son. After four years, she won with the help of France. Christine died on the 27th of December, 1663, at the age of 57. Interesting fact, through her daughter, Henrietta Adelaide, Christine was a direct ancestress of the Spanish branch of the House of Bourbon. Now, if we fast forward nearly two centuries, we arrive in the year 1840 with the marriage of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. It was on the 10th of February at one o'clock in the Royal Chapel of St. James's Palace. Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom married Prince Albert of saxe coburg and Gotha. They were both 20 years old and first cousins. Victoria wore a heavy white dress of silk satin with lace and a white lace veil. They enjoyed a wedding breakfast at Buckingham Palace, and the cake weighed over 300 pounds. Victoria and Albert spent their honeymoon at Windsor Castle. They would have nine children before Albert died in 1861. As we stick with the English queens, we're moving to an English queen consort instead. But this time, we're looking at the first Tudor queen consort, Elizabeth of York. It was on the 11th of February in 1466, 
that Elizabeth of York was born to Elizabeth Woodville and King Edward IV. But it was also on the 11th of February in 1503 that Queen Consort Elizabeth of York, wife of King Henry VII, died. Elizabeth was the eldest child and was named a Lady of the Garter in 1477. In 1483, her younger brother, Edward V, ascended the throne after her father's unexpected death. However, only two months later, her uncle had her parents' marriage declared invalid, which ultimately led to him becoming king, Richard III. Elizabeth's two younger brothers were taken to the Tower of London and never seen again. We know them as the princes in the tower. Elizabeth married Henry VII of England in July 1486 at Westminster Abbey. Henry had recently defeated Richard at the Battle of Bosworth Field and claimed the throne. Their marriage strengthened his claim and helped provide stability for the Tudor dynasty after three decades of fighting. Elizabeth and Henry had seven children, though only four survived past infancy. Arthur, Margaret, Henry, and Mary. Elizabeth was crowned Queen Consort of England in 1487 after the birth of their first son, Arthur. She was considered a good queen and is said that she was beautiful and intelligent, although she did not have much influence over political matters. Elizabeth became pregnant again in late 1502 after Arthur's death and gave birth to a daughter, Catherine. Unfortunately, Catherine died only a few days later, and Elizabeth died on the 11th of February, 1503, on her 37th birthday, due to complications of childbirth. Her family mourned deeply for her, and the tower was abandoned as a royal residence. Elizabeth was buried at Westminster Abbey, and Henry was buried next to her six years later. Interesting fact, throughout her life, Elizabeth was a daughter, sister, niece, and wife to the King of England. And that concludes this week in royal history. I hope you learned something new today. Otherwise, I want to hear about those rabbit holes I got you to go down. Send me a message and let me know what you've learned. And as always, thank you so much for listening. I'm Rebecca Larson. Until next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.